Uh, thanks very much, and especially to John um, and the other organizers for, for, for having me. Um, so I'm going to give a, a fairly broad brush interpretation of, of Mexico's experience with trade liberalization and try to draw some, some general lessons, uh, especially for Vietnam. I should say that this, this talk is out of the ordinary for me for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's a much broader brush than talks I usually give. I'm usually interested in papers about you know, the effect of X on Y. We're trying to be very, very precise about what X is doing uh, to Y. Um, uh, so, and it's also, uh, it's also out of the ordinary for me. I'm not making any claim to novelty. As you'll see as I go, I'm, I'm relying heavily on, on, on other ideas of others, and in some case, quite, quite old ideas. Okay, so why is Mexico uh, possibly an interesting example here, especially for Vietnam, but other, other countries? I mean, so it clearly differs um, in many ways, but it's illustrative, arguably, of, of issues that Vietnam and other countries will face in their future growth as they move into what you might think of as middle income status. And, and the, the puzzle of how to how to how to how to keep moving after you you, you reach middle income status, um, and the you know I don't know I'm, I'm, this is my first time in Vietnam I don't know so much but Vietnam has as other countries has been signing a number of different trade agreements um, with the U.S. There was a WTO accession uh, with Japan. There's uh, agreements through ASEAN and there's pending agreements with the EU and the and the TPP the, tr the Trans Pacific Partnership. So. Um, Arguably, the sort of issues we're going to be talking about um, are ones that are, that are directly relevant uh, to Vietnam now. With the advantage, though, that in Mexico, NAFTA is now 20 years old. Uh, liberalization is, is essentially 30 years old in Mexico. And so we have, we have a chance to take this sort of broad view of, of, of what's happened there. OK. Um, so again, sort of uh, very, very broad view of what's happened. Um, between 85 and 94, so following macro crisis in the early 80s, Mexico undertook a quite ambitious um, program of liber liberalization. Uh, so in part, that included trade liberalization. So Mexico unilaterally joined the GATT in, um, um, in 85. Uh, that continued in 1994. Is often, NAFTA is often seen as sort of a, a, a further commitment to this broader program, program, of, program of liberalization. Um, there was privatization of state-owned enterprises, there was liberalization of investment regime, and there was a general re reduction of the role of the state uh, in the economy. Um, so Mexico, I guess the, the point here and sort of motivating what I'm going to say later is that Mexico was trying to do this all by the book. Basically, it was doing liberalization, kind of the poster child for liberalization. Um, and the, you know, people who were advocating these reforms were quite confident that they would lead to rising average incomes and, and growth. And, and the fact is um, that Mexico's growth over the last 30 years has been, has been quite disappointing. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm uh, borrowing some, some slides from, this is from uh, Gordon Hansen has a piece in the, 2000, in the Journal of Economic Literature in 2010. Um, uh, Rafael Bergoing this morning had a, had a graph that looked uh, something similar to this. So basically he's comparing just, just normalizing in 1980, GDP per capita um, to be zero, and then looking, comparing to a number of different middle income countries. There are going to be three of these slides. So here's uh, comparing to, to Latin America, you can see that um, Chile has just vastly outperformed performed Mexico. Mexico is the green here. Mexico is, is closer to Argentina and Brazil. But I think the, the key point there is Argentina and Brazil have had um, uh, significantly more heterodox policy packages. Um, and so um, this, this is not what, what the advocates of reform would have, would have predicted back um, when Mexico was undertaking these reforms. The only country that Mexico is convincingly beating is, is Venezuela, um, which, is, which is not an enormous uh, mark of of distinction. Uh, the, if you look at Asian countries, again, so Mexico is down here green. So Malaysia, Indonesia, um, and Thailand are vastly outperforming Mexico. Mexico is down here, down here with, the, with the Philippines. Or also, if you look at um, a number of countries in, in, in Eastern Europe, again, Mexico, Mexico is green. You have uh, Turkey, uh, Hungary, um, Bulgaria are, are outperforming, and even Romania, um, uh, which has had a mixed history, has started doing better than doing better than Mexico. Okay. Now there are obviously a number of reasons um, why Mexico's growth may have been disappointing. Uh, a number of that have been emphasized. So there's monopolies and inefficient regulation. So this is a paper um, that Jim Heckman is a co-author. Underdeveloped credit markets. Santiago Levy is here in the in the conference. Um, has emphasized informality and evasion, and the, how the policy regime may may um, foster those. Uh, corruption is obviously a problem, and more recently, violence is obviously a problem. All these likely played a role. I don't want to discount them, but I do want to focus on trade and, and what I'm going to call the links between the pattern of specialization um, and and innovation. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about the intra, intra what I'm going to call inter and intersectoral resource shifts looking at, 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 at sectoral reallocation in Mexico. 
I'm going to try and relate that to, and then relate that to the sort of overall rate of innovation. Okay. Now, uh, I guess already a, a caveat about this. So evaluating the effect of trade policy is, is, is extremely challenging. It's challenging in, in many situations, but it's especially challenging in Mexico here, partly because NAFTA, um, which was undertaken in, or implemented in January 1994, was followed uh, very quickly by, by a major peso devaluation in the peso crisis, which started in December 1994 and continued into 1995. Um, as Ann Kruger and others have noted, that the, the, the nominal devaluation was just much, much larger than the tariff changes under, under, under NAFTA. Um, there may also have been sort of lagging effects of this mid-80s liberalization in Mexico, which was uh, in many ways probably larger than, than, the, than the changes under NAFTA, both in, in terms of tariff changes, but also in the removal of non-tariff barriers, um, et cetera. So essentially, I'm going to lump all these things together. I'm going to look broadly at what we think this opening of the Mexican economy, which had been quite closed prior to 1985, is now quite open, at broadly what that opening has, has done to, to, to sectoral shifts. Okay, so here, uh, so I'm using data from... Um, the Mexican Industrial Census, uh, supplemented by data from a 1999 survey um, called the NST, sort of a special survey where we can uh, on, also on manufacturing firms. Uh, so the, um, here on the x-axis, we just have the share of workers with more than, more, greater than or equal to 12 years of education um, as a measure of skill intensity by, by industry. Each dot is a four-digit NAICS industry, so that's the industrial classification used in North America. Um, and then we have the change in log employment between 1988 and 1998. The, the census are every five years, 88, 93, 98, et cetera. Okay. I, I'm focusing, you can see there's highlighting the size of these, of these symbols is, uh, is just the size of the sector. Um, I'm going to focus on a few. These, these red diamonds are in apparel and textile products. The, the blue triangles are transportation equipment, which is largely auto and auto parts. And there's also various electronics industries are the, are the green squares. Um, and then we have other, uh, other industries. OK, so what message are we taking from this? This is basically just saying that from at least from 88 to 98, which is this period of, initial period of liberalization, what you see is that there's a da sort of roughly downward sloping relationship. So that's saying that the industries that grew the most were the ones that were least skill intensive, which is basically exactly what we'd expect from a standard hexerolene type model, that Mexico should Integrating with the United States, that was by far the major, major trade partner. You would expect Mexico to specialize in, in unskilled labor intensive activities, and that's more or less, more or less what happened. I've also done work, um, other work, uh, sort of looking at effects within industries. There's sort of differential effects within industries. There's some pressure to upgrade within an industry. Um, but for the most part, I'd, I'd even argue, arguing against my previous work, the first order effect is just these sectoral shifts in the direction that we'd expect from, the, from a standard hexerolene um, type trade model. Okay, if you look at uh, capital intensity, so if you just take this as just the capital labor ratio, this is also from the economic censuses, there you can see the relationship even more starkly. Okay, so it looks like the least capital intensive industries are the ones that between 1988 and 1998 are growing the fastest. Okay, then what happened in Mexico? Uh, so this is now from uh, graph is in every way uh, similar, except now we're going from 1998 to 2008. And you can see basically those industries, so, so compared to this one, and especially that big square that's, that's, that's apparel, that big diamond, I mean, um, just tanked. Just really didn't do well at all uh, from 1998 to 2008. We'll talk a little bit about why that is, okay? But you can see that, that these, here are these sectors, um, uh, in general, at the, sort of the, at the low skill ends, um, had very underwhelming growth um, over the later period. If you look at the capital intensity, you see something, see something similar. Okay. Now, part of what's going on there um, which John alluded to, is what's happening in the maquiladora sector. So the maquiladoras are these assembly, uh, sort of assembly sector. Um, they are uh, uh, sort of sometimes called in-bond um, plants where they get relief from import duties if, um, if uh, goods are sub subsequently exported. You have to, to be a maquilador, you have to register with the government, and then you have to follow certain rules and, 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 and provide data to the government on a, on a monthly basis. So here, the main maquilador sectors are, are apparel, electrical and electronic equipment, and then transportation equipment, which is mainly, mainly auto parts. Um, here, I'm using two different uh, sources of data. The, the, the top one, it would be all, it's, it's from the economic censuses, where we only have data every five years, and that's uh, employment, total employment in the, in the sector. And then for the maquiladores, we actually have yearly data, or you could even get monthly data if you wanted. Um, so that, the, that's following. So that's saying, uh, so here we have total employment in apparel, and here we, here we have maquila employment in, in apparel. And the key thing to notice here is you have a big boom. So, so, so maquilador employment in general, in particular apparel employment, is often credited with 
sort of getting Mexico out of the, the, the peso crisis and the, the crisis in the, in the mid-90s. Okay, so, it, so clearly uh, employment grew very quickly. That's sort of what, uh, what people were expecting and, and advocates of reform were quite, quite excited about that. And there's, there's no question that that, that helped Mex cushion Mexico's, uh, the, uh, cushion the Mexican economy dur during this big, big crisis. Um, here you can see, now, and then what happened is, so basically following 2000, you, you, see, a, you see a major decline. Okay, so a big part of that is that big red, big diamond that, that uh, looked so low in the, in the second graph when we're looking cross sector was in part this apparel sector has just taken a major, major hit. Um, electrical and electronic equipment, this is slightly misleading in the sense that here I only have data every five years and so it looks like Maquilador employment exceeds total employment. That's obviously not what's going on. There would be a bump there if I could see what's happening in between years. But there again, you can see pretty, pretty strong growth between 95, and two, or between 95 and 2000. That's actually, sorry, 93 and 98. And, uh, and then stagnation afterwards with a little bit of recovery, so not quite as, as severe as, as an apparel, but anyway, in, certainly in this period, there's, a, there's a not very strong growth um, in employment. The one sector, sort of Maquila's, that seems to be doing okay is transportation equipment, so auto parts. So many of those uh, auto parts factories are, are integrated geographically into a North American production system for, for autos, um, and so that sector has been, has been more, so I'd say more robust growth. Okay. Um, what can we say about this, about the maquilas relative to the non maquilas? Um, uh, so here, this is comparing, so we're going to have maquilador sector versus non maquilas and then within the non maquilador sectors, I'm going to compare non-exporters and exporters. This is just sort of means, and this is from this 1999 Anistique survey, which has the advantage, unlike um, other Mexican data sets, that it, or the sort of the, the high frequency Mexican data sets, that it combines maquilas and non maquilas in the same, uh, in the same in the same data set. Uh, so so what, what do we see here? So, so the maquilas tend to be large. They obviously export almost all of their, uh, all of their, uh, their output, although they don't have to. They're highly, high share of, of foreign ownership. Um, now, okay, but getting here, you can see for look at capital labor ratio, which is here, so much, much lower than, than even the non-exporters non in the non-maquila sector. So they're clearly focused in labor-intensive activities. Uh, when you look at the share with, uh, greater than or equal to 12 years of schooling, again, that share is much lower. Uh, the percentage blue collar is higher than in the, in, than in the non maquila sector, the sort of non exporters or exporters in the non maquilador sector. Uh, years of schooling is also lower. Um, so, so, so it's clear, it's not surprising to anybody, but this, this tends to be the least skilled sort of phase of the production process that maquiladors are specializing in. Interestingly, I guess giving the full picture here, is their wages are not necessarily lower. You can see the wages are closer here to the exporter. Uh, exporter wages in, in both cases, which is interesting. Partly that's because maquilas tend to be focused in the northern part of Mexico where wages are a bit higher than in the center in the south, but it's also, it's, I think even when you look within the north, um, wages are, are reasonably, reasonably high relative to the, to the, to the non-exporting non-maquilador sectors. Okay, but the, what's, the, so what's my basic message so far in terms of just what happened? Um, so from 88 to 98, manufacturing specialized in less capital and less skill intensive activities, both, both across sectors and within sectors in the sense that there was a big shift towards this maquiladora type production. Um, from 98 to 2008, these sectors and subsectors tended to, tended to stay, okay? And so then the, now, as I mentioned before, there's some sort of other effects within industry that partly then in my own work I've tried to, I've tried to emphasize, but I, I, I think the sort of, when you look at this broad story of what was Mexico's response, I think the, the first two points are really the, the first, order, first order facts. Uh, now, okay, so the question is, you know, what happened, I'd say the, probably the most common explanation for what happened is that Mexico, uh, well, that China entered. Uh, and so people in Mexico often think of this, we had bad luck, right? We, this this uh, program would have worked, liberalization was a good idea, it just, it just so happened that we were liberalizing at the same time that, 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 that China entered the world, world trading system. Um, and in particular, this is a more severe problem for Mexico than for other countries, in part because the pattern of specialization, the goods that, that Mexico is exporting to the U.S., are highly correlated, essentially, with the goods that China is exporting to the U.S. Okay, so there's been various work on that. I have a graph I can show if you want. That's clearly, that's clearly true. There's, and I don't want to say there's no truth to this story. There clearly is a lot of truth to this, to this story. Um, uh, so this, there's a number of papers. Uh, this Utan Torres Ruiz paper is looking at the effect on Mexican maquiladores of Chinese competition in the, in the, in the U.S. market. Clearly had, had an impact. Uh, this is a graduate student of mine who's just finishing, who's, who's looking at using a, an approach of Otto Dorn and Hansen to look at uh, local labor market effects in Mexico of Chinese competition. He's finding strong effects that, that uh, 
regions in Mexico that had a lot of firms that were competing directly with Chinese firms tend to see lower employment growth. Uh, there are a number of different papers in the trade literature. This Hansen and Robertson or Shane Osa looking sort of slightly more structural uh, approaches looking at the effect of China, China on Mexico. Okay, what I'd like to argue though, and here uh, it's slightly more speculative than the sorts of arguments I usually, uh, usually make, but what I'd like to argue is that I think that Mexico would have had problems even if China, China had not entered. So, so we don't observe that counterfactual, obviously, but, but, but I think there's something to support this story, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay. Uh, and this is a very, again, here's this very old-fashioned idea. Um, uh, going back to Prebish, um, and then sort of formalized by Matsuyama, Hansen and Rodriguez Clare, sorry, this is not Harrison and, and Rodriguez Clare, in a uh, handbook of de development economics uh, sort of literature view. Uh, make this point and, and, and summarize it well. But basically, different activities are associated with different inherent rates of innovation and productivity growth. And liberalization, okay, which may bring about sort of reallocation to sectors that have a static, when I think of it as a static comparative advantage, may affect the rate of long-term growth and innovation. Okay, so it's a very simple idea, but I happen to think that it applies quite directly to the Mexican experience. Mexican experience. Okay, so let me show you uh, a little bit of evidence of that. Um, the, I'm going to use a measure, a measure of R&D from this NSDQ survey, this sort of, uh, which I mentioned before. So the survey asked, uh, this is in 1999, uh, and asked, asked 1999, since 1997, has this established and undertaken R&D? And I, I like this survey a lot because it uses a quite broad notion of what R&D is. It's not just patenting, not just you know, some, something new to the world. But you can see it says, if yes, if they ask, answered yes, they said, what do the R&D principally consist of, which could be design of new products, process improvements, product quality improvements, design, improvement and manufacture of machinery or equipment or other. So it's quite broad view. Basically, anything new or innovative, you know, sort of include what we might think of as upgrading, not necessarily coming up with something um, patentable. Uh, so, so I like that. It's not perfect, but it's not bad as a first pass. We're just going to code that as 0, 1 about whether the firm had any R&D or not. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to, to take an average at the sector level, this forges at sector level, um, and, and plot that using a plot similar to the ones I showed before. Okay, so this is just a cross section. I just have one year of data for this. I don't have it in, in uh, the other years of the, or at least the, the previous years of the, of the NSD, so I can't do it before and after. But anyway, in 1999, so what does this look like? Recall, this, here's this big red diamond. So recall what we said is that in that 88 to 98 period, the, the sectors that were growing fast were the ones down here, the low skill intensive, okay, and low capital intensive. Those sectors are sort of fairly systematically doing less upgrading than the more, cap, more skill intensive or more, if you do more capital intensive, it's even stronger, more capital intensive sectors. Okay, so again, same, 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 same thing. You see that there's the sectors out here are, are, are doing more of this R&D. The sectors down here, which were the ones that the Mexican economy was specializing in, um, were doing less. Okay, so that, I mean, mechanically is going to lead to less, less innovation, less R&D overall than, than, uh, uh, than, than would have taken place in the absence of those sectoral shifts. Um, another way of seeing this, you could see, so this is... Um, just R and, R, uh, this is looking at Makila's. This is kind of, again, giving you, make sure you get the full view, R&D intensity by sector. So if you look at all, I, just, I guess, all manufacturing for the non-exporters versus exporters and Makila's. So Makila's are sort of intermediate between the, the non-exporters and the exporters. It's not the case that Makila's are worse than the non-exporters, but they're sort of, they're sort of intermediate. Um, now, in part, that's because, so in apparel, actually, Makila doors are, are sort of comparable to exporters. But the apparel sector overall has less R&D or less upgrading than, than other sectors, and that's partly what's bringing this number down. Okay. Uh, a couple of other ways of, of, uh, of showing this, just to, if you don't like my, uh, that R&D measure from the anesthetic, uh, this is from a book by Lederman, Maloney, and Cervén at the, at, the, at the World Bank. So if you look at, uh, this is just patents per million workers, and here they've got Latin America and the Caribbean, sort of on average, versus, versus Mexico, okay? And you can see there, so in the 60s, Mexico has actually out, outperformed on this, on this alternative measure, outperforming the rest of the Latin American Caribbean. By 1995 to 2000, it's actually significantly underperforming, just in terms of patents. Okay. Um, they have some other comparisons. Korea is obviously a star here. And here, notice that the, the, the y-axis are changing, but, but uh, you know, the patents per workers are significantly below also other high-income countries. Another way of looking at a simple way, and again, this is just from downloading the, from the world development indicators, just the, the R&D spending as a fraction of GDP. You have Chile and China at, a boy, at about, about 0.65%. Um, percent. Uh, Korea obviously is a star you know, up there with, uh, with US and Canada, but, but Mexico is significantly below. 
Okay? Which is to say there are other countries, if you look at Argentina, you look at Brazil, they're also down there with Mexico, um, but, but, uh, but Mexico is being outperformed by, by, by Chile and China. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, summing up, uh, what it seems to me is that integration led Mexico to specialize in less capital and skill intensive activities, both across and within sectors. These sectors tend to be less innovative. Um, this did not have to be true. I wasn't actually uh, convinced that this would be true when I first did those plots of the innovation rate or the upgrading rate against capital intensity or skill intensity, but it turned out to be, it, the correlation appears to be uh, quite robust. So these sectoral shifts kind of tended to dampen the overall rate of innovation in the economy. Um, what if China had not entered? Um, so we don't, again, observe the counterfactual. But my sense is that even if there hadn't been China, there would have been other countries moving up the quality ladder and competing with Mexico. So that would have been Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, maybe even um, Vietnam um, would have been entering. So, I, so you, know, you can't not innovate and not have productivity growth um, for long before you're outcompeted by, by other countries. OK. Uh, so more research is needed, needless to say. If I had been asked by Tony Addison uh, yesterday what, you know, where, what, what graduate students should work on, I'd say go out and figure out uh, you know, what, uh, what works and what doesn't work in industrial policy. So we don't have a, we don't have a, have a, a lot of uh, evidence about that. Um, or we don't have a lot of what I'd call sort of rigorous econometric evidence about what works and doesn't work. Um, but the pattern suggests that there may be this trade-off between what I call static allocative efficiency and long-term productivity growth. So clearly there was some benefit in a static sense of reallocation towards sectors in which Mexico had a competitive advantage, right? But it may lead to lower growth in the, in the long run. And so that's now that we're in the long run, arguably, that may be what we're, what we're seeing. And so maybe that trade-off needs to be taken into account now when you start thinking about entering these, the, the liberalized um, trade regime. So, so liberalization alone may not be enough to bring about sustained, uh, sustained growth. That's, that's another way of saying that. Saying that same point, I think that there's strong evidence, a strong, a strong case, which Justin and John and, and many others have, have have made also for intervention, interventions to promote the sorts of activities that generate innovation and productivity growth, both across and within sectors. Um, uh, underlying that, you, there's an argument about uh, externalities. Okay, so you, somehow firms have to not be taking into account the effect of their own investments in, in innovation. Um, I'm working on other, have other work, in, especially in Pakistan uh, with some soccer ball producers, which I'm happy to tell you about at length um, at, during a break or something uh, about that, working, working on that. Um, anyway, so, so, so some caveats. And this is why this relates to another point that John made about, um, about trade policy versus, versus uh, industrial policy. So, um, these interventions do not have to be, so if, you, if we, we agree that there's a case for intervention in, to subsidize uh, innovative activities, it's not clear these interventions have to be at the border. Okay, so there's a well-established principle that it's actually better to address a market failure or, or, or something like this at the, at the source. In this case, you'd go to the innovative activities and subsidize them uh, directly in some sense. Um, and obviously, WTO accession limits the ability to, to conduct industrial policy through, um, through uh, tariffs or other restrictions at the border. Um, so we should, in, in that sense, I think my argument is really about industrial policy rather than, than trade policy. The other caveat, um, which is not, you know, again, not a new point to make, is that um, it's true that government officials have no special knowledge about which sectors or firms or ideas or technologies are likely to be uh, successful in the future. Okay? Uh, so many of the, the, the best intentioned officials uh, may be less well informed than the business people um, in the sector, although. They have different incentives and different, different objective functions, arguably, but they may have less information. Okay, so uh, I don't know how much time, how much I have got, a minute or two minutes or something, zero. Okay, let me, let me, go, let me do a, at, least the, at least the next two slides and then maybe I'll, maybe I'll stop. Um, so one uh, you know, common approach, which is a, that Laterman and Maloney have a, have, a, have a new book, which is arguing is that what you do is you do broad-based policies, which um, provide broad support for innovative activities without having to pick which particular firm or sector is going to, is going to be successful. That seems um, uh, to me like a very good idea. So you've got infrastructure or technical vocational education. Or another one would be removal of restrictions on, on, on imports of high quality or high tech uh, imported inputs. That seems like no brainer, but that would be, that sort of be in the spirit of this argument of doing things that broadly will support, will support innovation. Uh, a number of these policies uh, are along these lines are already in place in Vietnam. Um, which we can, we can talk more, but I, I don't have very much time, so I won't do that. Now, so the uh, other alternative would be targeted policies. Now, targeted policies, as we, we all know, are inherently more subject to corruption or capture or plain old, you know, sort of mistargeting. 
Um, but if implemented well, implemented well, they can be very, very effective. So again, this is, I was re reading up uh, on this in pre preparation for this talk, but so Vietnam has, has um, this law on corporate income tax and, and law 31, where you have essentially preferential tax treatment for investments in a number of areas. And so this is all very much in the spirit of trying to promote these innovative activities. So in high technology, scientific research, technology development, um, et cetera, high grade steel, energy, energy saving products, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, formulated the, uh, the interpretation of the Mexican experience before finding out what Vietnam was doing. But I think from the Mexican experience, you'd have to say these are the sorts of, we do want to think about these sorts of policies. Obviously, they're caveats. I'm sure there are ways that they could be implemented better. But there's, um, I'd say that there's a, there's a strong case for, for, for these sorts of policies. It's not a blanket case for blanket endorsement of, of, uh, of intervention. Obviously, there are many interventions just produce more distortions and rent seeking than, than growth. Um, but I think that the, the fact that, so not that there should be trade policy to promote, sub, promote innovative activities, but the fact that Vietnam is liberalizing trade means that direct support for innovative activities may be, may be more salient or maybe you know, even more necessary now than, uh, than before. Okay, so go out, the graduate students out there, go out there and tell us what, what works and what doesn't work and try and evaluate some of these policies. I have one idea that we could talk about, but maybe, maybe I'll stop and I'll let you ask me about that in the, in the, in the question and answer. Thanks.